friends in this session we'll see various neck swellings that appear in various aspects of the neck so we have got neck which is divided into anterior triangle and posterior triangle by sternocleidomastoid muscle so anterior triangle is again divided into various triangles by digastric muscle which is anterior belly and it is posterior belly so we have got submandibular triangle then we have got carotid triangle which is formed by superior belly of omohyoid and posterior belly of digastric and anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid muscle and again posterior triangle is divided into superior and inferior triangles by posterior belly of omohyoid muscle so we have got various swellings appearing in various aspects of these triangles so we have got midline swellings which are cystic and solid so we will now first see various swellings which are cystic in nature which appear in midline so we have got cervical dermoid then we have got subhyoid bursal cyst so this is hyoid bone to which these all two muscles are attached so we have got cyst which is occurring in subhyoid region which is burs subhyoid bursal cyst next we have got thyroglossal cyst then we have got cyst in relation to the isthmus of the thyroid gland next we have got cold abscess in space of burns there is suprasternal space of burns so this is suprasternal region we have got suprasternal space of burns we have got lymph nodes in suprasternal space so they can give rise to the suprasternal abscess that is cold abscess then we have got aneurysm of innominate artery so these are all cystic swellings next we have got solid swellings which are occurring in midline in which we have got lymph node swellings which occur from submental lymph nodes pre laryngeal lymph nodes and pre tracheal lymph nodes next we have got thyroid gland swellings we have seen in detail in thyroid about these lesions so these are diffuse swellings solitary nodule or multinodular goiter next we have got bony growth arising from manubrium sternae so which may be in midline then rarely a persistent thymus can cause a midline swelling next we have got ectopic thyroid so all the midline swellings are included within anterior triangle next we have got lateral swellings so lateral swellings can both be cystic and solid so for better clinical assessment the lateral swellings can be grouped according to their locations within either of the three triangles of the neck so we have got submandibular triangle so swellings occurring in submandibular triangle we have got cystic swellings which are plunging ranula lateral variety of sublingual dermoid retention cyst of salivary gland so these are cystic swellings which occur in submandibular triangle next we have got solid swellings which occur in submandibular triangle these are swellings arising from submandibular salivary glands so these are tumors sialithiasis sialolithiasis then sogren syndrome so tumors sialitis sialolithiasis and sogren syndrome these are four things which occur in submandibular triangle arising from submandibular salivary gland next we have got various lymph nodes in submandibular region so they may give rise to the solid swellings next we have got carotid triangle so this is most important triangle because major vascular structures lie in this triangle so we have got cystic swellings arising in carotid triangle which are branchial cyst abscess in the lymph nodes so various cold abscesses then carotid aneurysm cyst adenoma of lateral lobe of thyroid gland so it may go in the carotid triangle then we have got laryngosul so it is swelling arising from the larynx next we have got solid swellings which occur in carotid triangle so these are carotid body tumor lymph node swellings then solid swellings of the lateral lobe of thyroid gland sternomastoid tumor then branchiogenic carcinoma now we'll see what are the various swellings occurring in the posterior triangle so that posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle so cystic swellings among these are cystic hygroma solitary lymphatic cyst then abscess in the lymph nodes in posterior triangle so various cold abscesses then pharyngeal pouch arising from the superior part of the pharynx so various swellings are there kilans dehiscence leading to the superior pharyngeal pouch then we have got subclavian aneurysm which occur in the posterior triangle so among solid swellings we have got lymph node swellings and cervical ribs so posterior triangle so this is posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle we have got lymph node swellings and cervical rib among the all these swellings there are few swellings which can occur anywhere in the neck these are sebaceous cyst lipoma fibroma 
neurofibroma and hemangioma so we will see mainly important swellings which occur in the neck so first we will start with the carotid body tumor which is also called as chemodectoma or potato tumor so it arises from chemoreceptor cells on the middle side of the carotid bulb histologically it is non chromaffin paraganglionoma so these are very important terms because you may be asked question the cells of origin in carotid body tumors are following cells or histologically carotid body tumor is arising from which cells they may give option including non chromaffin paraganglionoma so you have to select that option there is an association with pheochromocytoma so you may find raise blood pressure of these patients the risk of malignancy is greatest in young patients with familiar tumors so when they occur in families they have got more chances of malignancy so approximately 10 to 35% of carotid body tumors are hereditary so this specific range of 10 to 35% should be kept in mind approximately 5 to 7% of carotid body tumors are malignant so what is the origin of carotid body tumor so chronic hypoxemia acts as a stimulus for hyperplasia of carotid body cells so since the chemoreceptor cells are stimulated by decrease oxygen tension a higher incidence of carotid body tumors is noted in oxygen deprived individuals so these are cyanotic heart disease patients or patients or people living in high altitudes where chronic hypoxia is present what are the clinical features they are usually unilateral present mostly in the fifth decade of the life the patient will often present with a long history of several years of slowly enlarging painless lump at the carotid bifurcation so at the carotid bifurcation this lump will be present the mass is firm rubbery pulsatile and is mobile from side to side but not upside down so it is mostly arising from carotid so it won't be mobile from upside down but it is mobile from side to side so you may be asked questions the swelling which are the following statements best describe characteristics of the car carotid body tumor so all these sentences can be asked and they may put a wrong one sometimes the mass can be emptied by firm pressure after which it will slowly fill in pulsatile manner a bruit may also be heard what are investigations doppler study and carotid angiogram these are investigations FNC and biopsy are contraindicated. So many a times you get patients with swelling in the neck. So before putting a needle, you should always do Doppler study and sonography of the swellings. Among treatment options, these tumors rarely metastasize, and their overall rate of growth is very slow. So the need for surgical removal must be considered carefully, as complications of surgery are potentially serious. the operation is best avoided in elderly patients the treatment of choice for carotid body tumor is surgical excision as the these tumors are highly vascularized preoperative tumor embolization may be advantageous as it will decrease the blood loss so whenever the tumor is more than 2 cm in size preoperative embolization is recommended so this is important point so preoperative tumor embolization they may give a clinical scenario of tumor more than 2 cm size arising neck which is pulsatile in nature what are the probable best therapeutic options so they may give embolization followed by excision directly excision or some other non specific causes so you have to choose when your choice is more than size is more than 2 cm size so you have to pre embolize this tumors next we have got cystic hygroma so cystic hygroma is a swelling usually occurring in the lower third of the neck so you have got lower third of the neck which is most commonly seen in this swelling it is most commonly seen in posterior triangle so we have seen earlier cystic hygroma is seen in posterior triangle of the neck but it may also occur in axilla groin and mediastinum so all these various regions should be kept in mind it can occur in axilla groin and mediastinum the etiology of this swelling is sequestration of portion of jugular lymph sac from lymphatic system so various lymphatics that run across the neck some of the lymphatics get sequestrated as isolated lymph swellings and they enlarge to give rise to this cystic hygroma it usually manifests in neonate or in early infancy or it may occasionally present at birth so these swellings may be congenital so among 
swellings which occur in congenital form the turner syndrome is mainly associated with this swelling so syndrome most probably associated with cystic hygroma is which of the following so you may be asked a question the swelling is soft and partially compressible and invariably increases in size when child coughs or cries the characteristic is that distinguishes from other neck swellings is that it is brilliantly translucent so when you get translucent test it is highly brilliantly translucent so the cysts are filled with clear lymph and they are lined by endothelium mostly these are multiple cyst but occasionally there can be unilocular the single large cyst can be there it may show spontaneous regression so over a period it may show spontaneous regression among treatment option surgical excision and sclerotherapy are the main treatment options complete surgical excision is preferred treatment but as the cystic hygroma is infiltrating within and around in important neurovascular structure so this cystic hygroma is infiltrating around important structure so all nerves or it may be present intervening anomalous major structures of the neck so it may be difficult to completely excise this swelling so because cystic hygromas are not neoplastic tumors radical resection with removal of major blood vessels and nerves is not indicated so it may have recurrence after excision but radical excision is not indicated injection of sclerosant agent such as bleomycin or derivatives of streptococcus pyogenes such as ok4432 so this is specific sclerosant derived from streptococcus pyogenes ok432 so with this sclerosant you can inject in this residual swellings or recurrent swellings intracystic injection of sclerosants appears to be effective for macrocystic hygromas as opposed to microcystic variety so whenever the cyst is very small you cannot have better sclerosant so when your cysts are big and or more or less single or two cysts are there then sclerosant works best the mo modern management of cystic hygromas include combination of surgical excision and along with image guided sclerotherapy so you have to under sono guidance you have to inject sclerosant in the cyst next we move on to a very important interesting swelling that is thyroglossal cyst so it is a cystic swelling developed in the remnant of thyroglossal tract or duct it may be present in any part of the thyroglossal tract so in embryology you must have learned that the thyroid arises from a pouch which develops from foramen cecum so this thyroglossal tract while traveling down it goes behind the hyoid bone and reaches up to the thyroid position so the swelling can appear in any of this region in midline so tract extends from foramen cecum to the isthmus of the thyroid gland what are the common sites subhyoid is the most common so this is most important point so you may be asked question subhyoid region is the most common it can occur in the region of thyroid cartilages it can be suprahyoid region or it may present in the floor of the mouth or it may be forming just beneath the foramen of the cecum so whenever you consider removal of this swelling so you should rule out that this is not the only thyroid that is present so only thyroid if sometimes that is the only thyroid in the body that is present so you should not invariably take it out you should locate first that normal thyroid is present then only you should excise this swelling so it is a midline swelling except in the region of thyroid cartilage where the thyroglossal tract is pushed to one side usually on the left side though it is a congenital swelling most common age of presentation is between 2 to 4 years the cyst can be moved sideways but not vertically so this all swellings in the neck they arising from major structures they can be pushed sideways but not from up and down peculiar features to differentiate from other swellings are the th thyroglossal cyst will move up with the protrusion of the tongue as the thyroglossal tract is attached to the tongue so it is the only swelling which will move with protrusion of the tongue apart from protrusion of tongue the other swellings which also move with deglutition so these are thyroid swellings subhyoid bursitis and sublingual dermoid so these swellings will only move with the deglutition but this is the only swelling that is thyroglossal cyst that will move with protrusion of the tongue and also on the deglutition the cyst is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium and squamous epithelium 
with heterotrophic thyroid tissue present in 20% of the cases. So this may be very much solid swelling or part of it can be solid. So we'll see now what are the complications. Recurrent infection. So many a times the tract from which it is connected to the base of the tongue can be patterned or this may get recurrently infected. There may be formation of thyroglossal fistula or carcinomatous change can be seen in this solid component of the cyst. So usually it is papillary carcinoma which can be seen in thyroglossal cyst. So carcinoma occurring most commonly in thyroglossal cyst is papillary carcinoma of thyroid. What are the treatment options? The treatment involves mainly six trunk operation which consists of in block cystectomy and excision of central bone that is central part of the hyoid bone to minimize the recurrence. So you should know that as the tract forms around the hyoid bone, central part of the hyoid bone is excised. Thyroglossal cyst is congenital but thyroglossal fistula is never congenital because fistula it occurs after some infection or inadequate removal of thyroglossal cyst. Next we have got swelling which is subhyoid bursal cyst. So it is accumulation of inflammatory fluid giving rise to cystic swelling in subhyoid bursa. So subhyoid bursa is located over thyroid membrane below hyoid bone slightly posterior to its lower border. So subhyoid bursal cyst is in very close relation with the hyoid bone. Pathologically it is lining is by epithelium and many times the contents are turbid or they can be clear. How do you diagnose? The history of pain with features of mild inflammation. It is midline, it is transversely elongated or discoid shaped cystic swelling. It is situated below hyoid bone. It is moved with deglutition. So we have seen earlier, it will move with deglutition. But there won't be movement on potrigen of tongue. We have seen earlier, the swelling which will move only on potrigen tongue and both on deglutition is thyroglossal cyst. But subhyoid bursal cyst will only move with deglutition, not with protrusion of tongue. It has got cystic feel. It is fluctuation is positive. It is transfumulated. So many times you may have transfumulation test positive if the fluid is clear. But many times if the fluid is not clear, it is turbid, then patient may have transfumulation test negative. Treatment is by complete excision by a skin crease incision. Friends, now we move on to various congenital deriv derivatives of branchial cleft. So, this is very interesting part. In embryology, the mature structures of the head and neck are embryologically derived from six pairs of branchial arches. They are intervening clefts, these are external thing and pouches internally. So, in embryology, you must have learned that neck is formed by various branchial arches. So, congenital cysts sinuses or fistulas result from failure of these structures to regress or they persist in aberrant location. The location of these remnants generally indicates their embryologic origin and guides to subsequent operative approach. So without understanding the embryology, the surgery may result in traumatizing important structures that desist or tracts may be traversing through. By definition, all branchial remnants are present at the time of birth although they may not become clinically evident until later in life. So in children, fistulas are more common than external sinuses, which are more frequent than cysts. So you should mark this statement because fistulas are more common than external sinuses, which are more frequent than cysts. So fistulas followed by lesser frequency in external sinuses, then followed by lesser frequency of the cyst. But in adults, cysts predominate. So the in children and in adults, these differences in various derivatives of branchial arches should be noted. So in adults, these are cysts and in children, these are fistulas which are common. What are clinical presentation? A continuous mucoid discharge from fistula or sinus to the development of cystic mass that may become infected. So patient may present with cystic mass in the neck. Branchial remnants may also be palpable as cartilaginous lump or cord corresponding to the fistulous tract. Dermal pits or skin tags may also be evident. So you may get dermal tags in front of ear. So now we'll see first branchial remnants. These are typically located in front of or back of the ear or in upper neck in the region of mandible. So these are most commonly located around ear. 
Fish oils typically coax through parotid gland, so they are tracked which may travel through parotid gland deep or through the branches of the facial nerve or end in external auditory canal. So this is very important statement. So you may be asked which of the following sentences best describe the tract of first branchial cleft limb nerve. So you may be asked question like the clinical scenario is given, patient is found continuously discharging sinus in front of the ear. Which of the following situations it is seen? So you have to answer that branchial cleft remnant of first arch. Now we'll see remnants of the second branchial cleft. So these are most common. So rather than first, this is the second which is most common. The external opening of this remnant is located along the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid, usually in the vicinity of the upper half to the lower third of the muscle. So this is the most common location of remnants of second branchial cleft. So upper half to the lower two third. So they are seen in this part of the region. The course of fistula must be anticipated preoperatively as step ladder counter incisions are often necessary to complete excise to completely excise the fistula. So this fistula will be traversing in the various aspects of the neck amongst various vessels. So we'll see now how it goes inside. So typically the fistula will first penetrate platysma, then will ascend across along the carotid sheet to the level of hyoid bone. Then it will turn medially to extend between carotid bifurcation. So this will first go through platysma, then it will go through hyoid bone and then cover across the carotid vessels and it will turn medially. The fistula then courses behind the posterior belly of digastric and stylohyoid muscles to end in the tonsillar fossa. So you may be asked question, the branchial fistula ends in intraoral in which region, tonsillar fossa or they may give various pharynx like options. So it is tonsillar fossa where the branchial fistula ends. So by step ladder pattern it is meant that you first you start excising from external opening then you go inside. Once you have reached the carotid, do you again take another incision? You take out this cord out tract from that incision, again go inside. So treatment of choice in branchial fistula is excision by step ladder pattern. Now we will see third branchial cleft remnants. Usually they do not have associated sinuses or fistulas and are located in the suprasternal notch or clavicular region. So you get these remnants in suprasternal notch or clavicular region. So these most often contain cartilage and present clinically as firm mass or subcutaneous abscess. So they form as a firm mass or abscess. Now we will see cystic swelling that is called as branchial cyst. So it is the cystic swelling arises in connection with the persistent cervical sinus which is formed due to the fusion of overgrowing second branchial arch with the sixth branchial arch. So amongst pathogenesis we have got conventional theory which we will be describing as the second branchial arch migrates towards the surface and overgrows the third and fourth arches and it will ultimately fuse with the sixth arch forming a cavity called cervical sinus. You should have noted that fifth arch disappears completely in embryology. So normally this sinus disappears but if persists this will accumulate the fluid inside it and it will give rise to a cystic swelling called as branchial cyst. The secretions that are formed in this branchial cyst, they usually come from appendages of ectodermal lining of enclosed space, sweat and sebaceous gland. The branchial cyst usually lies superficial to these structures derived from second and third branchial arches that is lesser cornea of hyoid bone, posterior belly of digastric muscle, facial nerve and external carotid artery. Sometimes the second arch fails to fuse with sixth arch and give rise to the branchial sinus or fistula. We have seen earlier the causative factors for bronchial fistula. So pathologically the lining of cyst wall is by squamous epithelium surrounded by a large amount of lymphoid tissue so it is more prone for infection. Contents are of cheesy material. They remain many a times they resemble a tonic abscess or a tubercular abscess. But the most characteristic thing is that among the abscesses you find if you find cholesterol crystals then you should consider is bronchial cyst. So cholesterol crystals is a hallmark of finding in the bronchial cyst. So this is an important statement. So friends, what are differential diagnosis? Cold abscess in the neck, 
सिस्टिक हायग्रोमा प्लंजिंग रेनुला देन सर्वाइकल डर्मॉइड कॅरोटिड बॉडी ट्यूमर अँड सॉलिटरी एनलार्ज लिम्फ नोड व्हिच इज सॉलिड और सब मेंडुलर सलाइवली ग्लैंड स्वेलिंग सो दीज आर ऑल डिफरेंशियल डायग्नोसिस फॉर दिस ब्रांकियल सिस्ट द ट्रीटमेंट इज विथ एक्सिजन ऑफ द सिस्ट थ्रू इन्सिजन अलॉंग द लँगज लाईन द वॉट आर टू प्रिकॉशन्स टू टेक ड्युरिंग एक्सिजन सो प्रिकॉशन्स टू बी टेकन आर ॲज अ सिस्ट वॉल इज थिन अँड डेलिकेट सो यू शुड बी होल्डिंग विथ एनी टिश्यू फोर सेप्स अँड इम्पॉर्टंट स्ट्रक्चर्स टू विच यू शुड अवॉइड इंजुरी इज हायपोग्लॉसल अँड स्पायनल ॲक्सेसरी नर्व्स कॅरोटिड आर्टरीज अँड वॉल ऑफ द फॅरिंग्स सो फ्रेंड्स वी आर सीन व्हेरियस स्वेलिंग्स इन द नेक विच ऑकर इन मिड लाईन कॅरोटिड ट्रँगल सब मॅन्डुलर रिजन अँड पोस्टर ट्रँगल सो फॉर वी आर सीन व्हेरियस स्वेलिंग्स दॅट ऑकर इन नेक सो नाव वी विल सी सम स्वेलिंग्स विच मे कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स सो यू मे बी आस्क क्वेश्चन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्वेलिंग्स डज नॉट कंटेन और दे डू नॉट कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स सो दिस इज द स्वेलिंग्स विच कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स आर ब्रँकल सिस्ट सो इफ यू आस्पिरेट द फ्लुइड फ्रॉम ब्रँकल सिस्ट इट मे कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स सो इट इज हाउ यू डिफरेंशिएट फ्रॉम कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल फ्रॉम एनी डर्मॉइड स्वेलिंग बिकॉज बोथ दिस सिस्ट द कंटेंट्स आर चीजी व्हाईट मटेरियल सो इट इज ब्रँकल सिस्ट डेंटल सिस्ट डेंटिजेरस सिस्ट सिस्टिक हायग्रोमा थायरोग्लॉसल सिस्ट अँड ऑकेजनली ओल्ड हायड्रोसिल मे कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स सो दीज आर ऑल द स्वेलिंग्स विच मे कंटेन कोलेस्ट्रॉल क्रिस्टल्स इन द फ्लुइड कंटेनिंग दे नेक्स्ट नाव वी मूव ऑन टू अ पिक्युलर ट्यूमर कॉल्ड ॲज स्टर्नोमॉस्टर ट्यूमर और कंजिनॅट्रल व्रायनेक दॅट लीड्स टू टॉर्टिकोलिस सो दिस इज डिफॉर्मिटी कॅरेक्टराइज बाय टिल्टिंग ऑफ हेड टुवर्ड्स शोल्डर अलॉंग विथ टॉर्शन ऑफ नेक अँड डेव्हिएशन ऑफ हेड टू अपोजिट साईड सो इफ द पेशंट हॅज गॉट दिस साईड ऑफ नेक इन्वॉल्वमेंट सो पेशंट इफ दिस साईड ऑफ स्टनोक्डोमॅस्टर्ड इज इन्वॉल्व सो इट विल गो ऑन अपोजिट साईड इट विल कॉन्ट्रॅक्ट so this will be the position of neck so sternocleidomastoid if goes on contraction on the same side the neck is turned to opposite side so opposite side of the muscle is involved on which the neck is turned about 20% of cases to start with there is a hard lump over sternocleidomastoid muscle which is noticed between first to four week it may disappear within a few months so many a times you get swelling in the sternocleidomastoid region which may disappear in few months what are the various causes of sternomastoid tumor so ischemia it is suspected that sternomastoid arteries which might be obstructed during difficult labor may lead to the necrosis of sternocleidomastoid muscle in that segment along with subsequent fibrosis or there may be trauma to sternocleidomastoid muscle leading to the formation of hematoma during birth so this hematoma may lead further to fibrosis leading to the contraction of sternocleidomastoid on that side it may be associated with other congenital deformities like club foot or congenital dislocation of feet hip so congenitally it may occur in various forms other theories are venous thrombosis or infective my- myositis of sternocleidomastoid muscle So what are the operative measures that can cure sternocleidomastoid tumor so subcutaneous stenotomy at the lower end so after birth uh, subcutaneous stenotomy can be done by inserting or uh, taking a small incision you have to take the lower end of clavicle mus- muscle so sternocleidomastoid muscle at lower end is cut so there can be open division of both heads of sternocleidomastoid at the lower end so many times along with sternocleidomastoid muscle a deep fascia of the neck can also be cut so if necessary carotid sheath can also be given incision so all these structures when present for long time they undergo fibrotic contracture so all these structures may need release so sclerosis muscular can also be divided so many a times you may be asked question which of the following structures are incised while giving release to the sternocleidomastoid tumor or rhinic so congenitally all these structures which may undergo contraction after birth so all these structures may need to be released so you should not just only take it is sternocleidomastoid tumor you just have to release sternocleidomastoid so all these other structures should also be kept in mind open division of upper end of sternocleidomastoid muscle 
can also be done at many times. So it is final accessory nor should be safeguarded. So advantage of upper end division is the it, the scar may get hidden along the hairline. Now we move on to cold abscess in neck. So many times cold abscess can give rise to the swelling in the neck. So on many occasions the soft swelling called as cold abscess it is present due to accumulation of pus which is of tubercular origin. So it may encounter be in any region of the neck commonly in posterior triangle. So this is the posterior triangle in which the cold abscesses are common. So cold abscesses may be arising from a various caseation of lymph node or they may track along spinal column along the nose. So you have to give to anti-tubercular treatment after diagnosis. So tubercular treatment may be continued for prolonged time. Now we will see various pulsatile swellings in the neck. So these are aneurysm of carotid artery, aneurysm of the subclavian artery, carotid body tumor, these are transmitted pulsations or lymph node swellings in the region of carotid artery, they will have transmitted pulsations. You can have primary toxic goiter, so which may be pulsatile occasionally. So we have seen other swellings like sternocleidomastoid and we have seen its treatment. We have also seen various pulsatile swellings in the neck. Thank you.